Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Yep, it's the world's most dangerous morning show, The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee, DJ Envy had to run out, but we have a special guest. She's an American journalist and, and writer. She's got a new book out called There Goes Gravity, A Life in Rock and Roll, <laughs> about her life as a music journalist. Lisa uh, Robinson is here. What's happening, Lisa? Now, so now, well, that's, thank that's, thank you for that introduction, but that's my old book. My new book is called oh. Nobody Ever Asked Me About the Girls. Lisa, but before we even get into this book, I want to talk more about you and some of your historical interviews, because, you know, I'm always impressed by all the people that you've had the opportunity to sit down and talk to. And a lot of these are artists who were very elusive, didn't do many interviews, but for some reason, they really trusted you. Yeah, I mean, if you look behind me, that's not a virtual background. Those are original cassettes. There's only a part of them, original cassettes and CDs. I mean, I started out interviewing a lot of boys, a lot of guys, Led Zeppelin, the Rolling Stones, Michael Jackson, John Lennon, um, Curtis Mayfield, the Isley Brothers. I mean, I go way, way back old school. And because I got the trust, I think, of those guys, and I wrote about their likes, their interests, their passions and so forth. I wasn't a reviewer, I wasn't a critic. And so people trusted me and I was able to then get to a lot of other people. And also in terms of women, the reason I called this book, Nobody Ever Asked Me About the Girls is because for the past four decades, literally people have been asking me, what's Jay-Z really like? Well, I mean, you know, you get this too. What's, what was Michael Jackson like? You know, what was John Lennon really like? And everybody was always asking me about guys and I interviewed so many incredible women and I just thought it was about time to put some of their stories down. Well question Lisa do you think that was about gender or just stature? I think it was both. I think it was such a boys club for so long especially rock and roll and even hip-hop when it started you know when Queen Latifah came out with Ladies First which felt like a manifesto um it was just, there weren't that many women that could pick up guitars in the 70s. You know, there were a few, a few white women who picked up guitars, but there were so many incredible black women who were singers, Patti LaBelle, Tina Turner, uh, Vanetta Fields, going all the way back to Big Mama Thornton and Sister Rosetta Thorpe. And I grew up with all this music and my husband, my late husband played it on the radio and I heard it on the radio from him, even though he got fired four times mm -hmm. for playing unfamiliar music, which was black music, Tina Turner mostly. And so I was able to get to women like Tina Turner or Anita Baker or Patti LaBelle or back in the day, you know, wonderful, incredible singers because other people weren't going after them. They were going after Mick Jagger. They were going after John Lennon, you know? And um, it's interesting because I saw Bevy Smith on your show and she was talking about how when she worked at Rolling Stone, they would have rather put a dead beetle on the cover than a black musician. Mm -hmm. And I went through the same thing even at Vanity Fair from 1999 until just recently with our new editor in chief who totally changed the policy but I mean, it took me 10 years to get Jay-Z on the cover. So that's definitely racial. It took me a long time to get Beyonce on the cover, which was both gender and racial. And this has been something in the music industry and in journalism that's gone on for a long time. Certainly gender had a tremendous amount to do with the stature. They go hand in hand. One superstar you talk about is Tina Turner, right? And mm -hmm. Tina Turner having obviously come out with Ike Turner, then she was kind of blackballed for a while because people didn't feel like without Ike Turner, she could really make it. So- Yeah, T Tina and I spent a lot of time together. I was very lucky to interview her a lot, especially in the eighties and the early eighties. And then when she finally had her solo success with What's Love, got to do with it and private dancer. And I was with her one night, I write about this in the book. We were at the Ritz backstage 
and David Bowie was there and John McEnroe was there and Keith Richards was there. And there were a whole bunch of us like in her fan club and her album had just gone to, her single had just gone to number one. And we were sitting backstage and she was scared that Ike was gonna come in with a gun. And she said that she was never gonna write about him until he was underground and dead. But then she changed her mind, obviously. And she did write her book, I, Tina. But what she told me was that when the duo broke up, that people would not book her, that she had to do lounges in hotels in San Francisco dressed in sequin Bob Mackie dresses, which is not what she wanted to do. She wanted to be a rock and roll singer and perform in the places where the Stones and Rod Stewart and Michael Jackson and people performed in 20 seat arenas and she finally did. But until she could prove herself with those hit records, she went through a struggle. And I mean, this is after all those years of abuse. You know, imagine what she went through, just being beaten up by that man for years and years. And she said that even the beatings weren't the worst thing. The worst thing was his cheating. And I've heard this from a tremendous number of women, whether it's Mary J. Blige or even Jennifer Lopez, when she was with Puff, you know, she was very paranoid that he was cheating on her. And of course they're very good friends now, but you know, the book has themes. I wrote about abuse. I wrote about motherhood. I wrote about love and marriage. I wrote about business and money. And the thing that's the overriding theme of my life and of all these women is that we all have the same problems. I mean, I was fortunate to be married to a very evolved man who helped me have a career, mentored me, encouraged me, but a lot of these women couldn't have relationships because they were more successful than the guys or they had the real conflict about whether they should have children or not, or they went through abuse like Rihanna and Tina Turner. And, you know, some of them actually had rape. Fiona Apple, Tori Amos. Anyway, you know, I'm, I'm going on and on, but back to Tina. Yeah, she had a problem with a solo career because everybody thought she wasn't any good without Ike. Mm -hmm. Lisa, how do you how do you think the the role of women in entertainment has has evolved over the years? Has it gotten better? Is it worse? Is it the same? I think the role of women in general has gotten better, but honestly, it's like five minutes ago. I was watching a documentary on Martin Luther King and um, the FBI and how they had tapped his phones, and there were all these shots of the cabinet and Lyndon Johnson's cabinet and Congress, and you see a absolute sea of white faces. And it's just shocking to see this now because there aren't enough women in Congress. There certainly isn't enough diversity in Congress or in any corporation, frankly, or heads of corporations. And the music business is the same. There are about five major women who run companies. I interviewed three of them off the record in the book. If you read the book, I think you could probably figure out who they are, but I did promise them I would do it anonymously. <clears throat> but, you know, even a woman who we all know who runs a billion dollar empire told me that she sits in a conference room and men talk over her. Mm -hmm. They interrupt her. Um, they don't pay attention to her. They don't give her the respect that she certainly deserves. And women in music in general are paid more attention to now if they sell records. It's the same as it's always been. Joni Mitchell made more money than the Eagles because she sold out bigger arenas. You know, with what's happening now, especially with women like Lizzo and Megan and Georgia and, you know, Cardi. And we're at that moment again where women are high up on the charts. But I've seen this every decade, whether it was the 80s with Pat Benatar and Cindy Lauper and, you know, uh, Madonna, or whether it was in the 90s with Destiny's Child and uh, Salt and Pepper. And I mean, there's just 
every decade we go through a period where women rule the charts, but I'm not sure that they're still not underpaid, undervalued, and underutilized. Um, it's interesting you say that about Salt and Pepper too, because they have this uh, this biopic coming out on I know. Life, on Lifetime. And one of the things when I was researching them that they talk about is how they were at the top of the charts selling millions of albums. They sell more albums than Wu Tang but they don't get celebrated in the same way as some of their male counterparts who they may have outsold, but for some reason, it's just that same amount of respect hasn't been there. Yeah, I know Cheryl James told me, and it's in the book, when we were talking about how women are treated in male executive rooms. And she said, well, if you carry yourself a certain way and you act like you have confidence in yourself, they have to respect you. And she said that, and I'm sure to some degree, yes, that is true. On the other hand, I mean, I can't wait for that biopic. I'm dying to see it. I've already programmed it into my DVR. But I mean, even Destiny's Child, with all the records they sold, Beyonce told me that when she did her first album, her first solo album, they told her she didn't have a single. <laughs> and then she said, and they were right, I had four. But I mean, can you imagine with every single thing that woman has gone through? I mean, and they still gave her a problem at the record company. I mean, you know, you've talked to all these people, you know the stories. It's just that women in general are paid less than men. You know, I, I, I never thought of myself as some raging feminist. I mean, I thought of myself as being an angry person in general because of what's going on certainly now in this country. But even when I was growing up, you know, I grew up, I was a child of the 60s. I was on those marches. I mean, I just thought things had changed and obviously no, they haven't. And things are better for women now, Charlemagne, in the music industry and everywhere else. I mean, we have a woman half black, half Asian, South Asian, whatever, you know, vice president being inaugurated tomorrow, which just fills me with hope and joy. But I don't know, we still have to use that word still, and we still have to use that word only. And um, it's it's not enough, so, it's, so Lisa, it's not enough. Are you, are you saying that they told Beyonce she didn't have a single because she was a woman? Because I mean, guys get told that all the time, they don't have a single. I think that people are told all the time they don't have a single because these men were the ones making these decisions as opposed to leaving it up to the artist. And until the artist has enough power that she can pretty much demand, I mean, Lord, for example, told me that when she went into the record company um, meetings, she would love to go in and shoot down a bunch of million dollar ideas because she knew what 16 year olds would want to hear more than those old men would. And she was right, but she had a hit. And if they hadn't, she hadn't had that hit or if Adele hadn't had that hit or if Beyonce didn't ultimately have that hit. You know, I was in a recording studio once with Gwen Stefani when she was recording a song that was so amazing that we were all like drinking champagne and dancing and jumping around. <clears throat> and then she took it to the record company and they told her they didn't like it and they didn't put it out. And I mean, I just think that that kind of stuff, you know, I, I'm sure it's happened to some men too. I mean, look at how much Prince fought with his record label. You know, there's endless stories of white male rock groups being turned down by every record company. U2 is a perfect example. But I just think that until you sell the records and you make them money, you don't have the power. It's like almost everything else. It's worse in the record industry because women are so insecure, I think, about their looks, their image. You know, no one is judged as much as women about their looks, their image, I mean, Tina Turner told me when she wanted to wear leather jackets and jeans, she was given a hard time. You know, um, Beyonce told me 
that in the early days of Destinies, she couldn't get designers to give her clothes. Can you imagine? I mean, Rihanna told me when she got an award in Canada, she got a call from her record company. Instead of congratulating her on winning the first award I ever won, she said, this is all in the book. She said, yeah, they, that she wore the wrong color lipstick. And she said, are you serious now? I mean, you're not congratulating me on winning the first award I ever got. I, you're telling me that the lipstick was too pink. I mean, that goes on with women much more than it ever did with men. So and that's even, another issue. And Lisa, even in the world of journalism, there's just certain questions that will be asked of women that wouldn't be a big deal or wouldn't even be asked to a man, certain subjects and topics, right? Yeah, I mean, I never did that. You know, I always interviewed men the same way that I would interview women. I interviewed women the same way I interviewed men because I respected the talent. I never really wanted to talk to anybody who I didn't admire their work. Witness, I've never interviewed Taylor Swift. Yeah, we see. <laughs> you don't like Taylor Swift's work, Lisa? <laughs> I'm not a fan, let's just put it that way. And also, you know, I admire people's drive and ambition but there's a certain grace that you can have to it. I think Beyonce is a perfect example of a, of a woman who was, as a young girl, was incredibly ambitious, incredibly disciplined, worked her ass off. I mean, definitely was driven, but she wasn't vulgar about it. She wasn't obvious and transparent and unpleasant about it. Let's just put it that way. I mean, Beyonce's discipline is such, and I write about this in the book and I have talked about this, but I can't, the first time I ever interviewed her, she ordered a pizza and she had one slice. And I said, aren't you going to have any more? And she went, no. And I said, well, I'm going to eat the whole thing. And she said, well, this is part of my job. I can only have one slice. And we were at a party once where they brought a brownie to the table and they broke, she broke it up into four little squares and had one tiny square. I mean, to me, who loves food, I just was blown away by that kind of discipline. Obviously, not, that's not the most important thing about her. But um, we were talking, I think, about the people whose work I admire. And when I interviewed them, I was very, very, like I would talk to Mick Jagger about his sex life. I would talk to Robert Plant or John Lennon about the musicians they didn't get along with. I wasn't that interested in analyzing their lyrics and I didn't judge their music. And I think that was a big relief for them. So talking to those guys opened the door for me to then be able to pretty much talk to anybody I wanted to and I was incredibly obsessed with music my whole life. I was always a fan. So I approached it from that point of view. But there's no question that women get asked things in general. Sirens. Women get asked things in general that men don't get asked. Men do not get asked, do you want to have children? Um, women always get asked that. You know, I get asked that. I never had children. I was married to my late husband for over 45 years. We never wanted children. These are my children. These tapes, my work, my life. But, you know, for the first 20 years or so of my so-called adult life, when I was interviewing people, the subject of children didn't even come up. Now, every woman who's a mother, who's a musician, is asked how does she juggle her career and her family? I don't think too many men get asked that question, you know, and um, women get asked about their looks and their clothes and men to some degree, I guess. I mean, I know in the 60s and the 70s, people, uh, 60s was a little before my time, thank God, something before my time, but in the 70s, yeah, I talked to Mick Jagger about his clothes, but most people didn't. I, I agree with you, Lisa, but some people will say asking a man about his sex life 
is 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 just as personal and, and intrusive because if you, uh, if a guy did that to a, a woman he was interviewing it'd probably be a problem well I, let me take that back a little bit i don't think i asked them about their sex life i think i would talk to them about their personal life in a very friendly chatty gossipy kind of way it wasn't probing. It wasn't intrusive. I respected their private life. I mean, one of the reasons that I think I got trusted to be around these guys and anybody for that matter is if somebody told me something was off the record, it was off the record. And I kept it off the record and they knew that. And that's the same with this book. I mean, I talk a lot about a lot of things in this book, but there are things that were off the record that I do not write about because even though some of these people are dead, I mean, John Lennon told me stuff off the record that to this day, I have not written about. Jay-Z's told me things off the record that I won't write about because I respect people's private lives. I mean, look, I was on the road with Led Zeppelin five times in the 70s. I saw a lot of groupies around them. I knew they all had wives and children at home in England, but I didn't witness any of the real supposed depravity that went on. I just wasn't part of that. I never took drugs. I never slept with musicians. People may have thought I did. Oh, why is she around all these guys? You know, cause I was one of the few at the time who was female, who was traveling with male rock bands. But I was married to a guy who was so much cuter than any of them. And we were newly married and I adored him and he was smarter than any of them. And there wasn't even a temptation. I mean, it just wasn't part of my life. So when I say I talk to them about their sex life, maybe that's not the right term. I think I just chatted with them about things they wanted to talk about. They were relieved to not have a critic in the room analyzing their lyrics, let's put it that way. It was a much more personable kind of conversation. Right. Now, one, one thing you did discuss because you just talked about it too, about women being asked about having kids and you discussed a conversation that you had with Adele where you told her um, it was brave of her to have a child in the midst of her of a consuming career. And she said, I think it's the bravest thing to not have a child because me and all my friends were pressurized to have kids. That's what adults do. Yeah, I mean, I was with Adele uh, backstage at Staples when she was on her last tour and she had had a child. He was, I think at that time, maybe four. I don't remember how old her son was, but she had a big playroom set up for him in her dressing room. And I said, well, first of all, the minute that we got in the car together, she started talking to me about postpartum depression. I did not bring it up. I didn't even know she had postpartum depression. She brought it up because it was clear to me that she wanted to talk about this. She had been waiting to talk about this and she was waiting to talk about it with a woman journalist. And we were doing a cover story on her in Vanity Fair and she, just went sailing off talking about postpartum depression. And I said to her, well, did you ever take any medication for it? You know, we just had a normal conversation like you and I would have or any of my friends would have, or if somebody brought up that subject, I would then continue on that subject. And I said to her, well, I think it's amazing that you actually could have a child in the middle of this huge career because it's tough to juggle because women, I mean, it's changed a lot. Men are very much more active in their children's lives now than they were certainly in the 70s when these rock and roll musicians were on the road, you know, marauding all over the country and picking up groupies and not seeing their families for months at a time, no cell phones, no one could find them. And um, I said to Adele, I think it's brave to have a child uh, in the middle of this career. And she said, I think it's brave not to have a child because there is so much pressure on women of my generation to have children. And I thought, wow, that was a revelation to me because she's 30 or 32 or whatever. When we talked, she was in her late 20s and I wasn't that aware of it. 
Um, I remember growing up that there was a tremendous amount of pressure on women of my generation to get married, have children, be a wife. And I mean, even though I grew up in a very sort of left wing leaning New York household, uh, my father who was an evolved man once said, well, he died, he was talking about someone who died and he said, well, he died a happy man. He saw all his daughters married. And I thought, wow, is that what you expect of me? You know, that's not my dream for myself. I mean, I didn't even know what I wanted to do until actually I did meet the guy that I married and then he turned columns over to me. But um, apparently there is all this pressure on women to have children and uh, I don't know, to me it's brave. I talked to Rihanna about this and she said she absolutely wanted children. And I said, I was always scared of childbirth. I mean, that's not why I didn't have children. I wanted a career and I didn't think I could handle both. And my husband and I were both on the sort of same page about that. But I said to Rihanna, I was always scared of childbirth. And she said, so am I. She said, I think anybody who doesn't admit it is lying, but she still wanted them. So my feeling about that was, if you want children, you should have them. And if you don't, you should not be pressured into having them. But Adele really opened a window on that whole thing to me because I wasn't aware of it. Where, where do you think um, the, the, the shift occurred that, that, that loosened the grip on expectations for, for famous women or career-driven women? Because, you know, there was a time where they'd be like, oh, you can't get pregnant, you know, in order to preserve your career. So where do you think the shift happened? Well, I'll tell you one thing that I have in the book. There was the man who's a very famous, not famous, but a big music agent was backstage at a concert with me. And he said, do you know that no woman who's had a child never had a number one record? And I just was floored. I said, excuse me? First of all, what? Uh, what about Beyonce? What about Adele? And he went, oh yeah, I forgot about them. And then the same man said to me, you know, there's no woman that could sell out this stadium. And we were in a stadium where there were a bunch of classic rock acts, men in their 60s, some in their 70s, white male rock musicians with bald heads, stomach hanging over their belts, and I said, are you telling me that there's no woman in their 60s or 70s, I guess, maybe Stevie Nicks with Fleetwood Mac, Beyonce was in her 30s, Gaga was in her 30s. Okay, no woman in their 60s, except maybe Barbara Streisand, who could sell out this stadium and he went right. And this was only like three or four years ago. So in terms of a shift, and I don't know, I think Beyonce had a tremendous amount to do with evolving and being taken incredibly seriously as a powerhouse in the music industry. I mean, I think to some degree in the 80s, Madonna maybe did because of MTV. I was not a fan of her either, but um, you know, image-wise, I knew where all her influences came from. So she, to me, was not some sort of revolutionary fashion icon. You know, the girls on 8th Street all dressed like that before she did. And uh, MTV changed a lot of stuff because you could see people. So all of a sudden, you had to look good and be pretty and... I don't know if Janis Joplin ever would have gotten on MTV. I mean, it took Michael Jackson a long time to get on MTV. It took Tina Turner a long time to get on MTV. Um, I think maybe the 90s changed a lot. It's hard for me to really say because I'm viewing this over a four decade period and I go way, way back to old school women like early Tina Turner when she was with Ike, you know, to me, I would go see the Rolling Stones in concert and Tina Turner and Ike Turner would open the show and I'd be much more interested in Tina Turner singing Proud Mary than even the Rolling Stones. And I was a Rolling Stones fan. Well, um, Tina Turner's a better performer. 
I'm sorry? Tina's a better performer. Oh, Tina was the most amazing performer. I mean, without question. The dancing, the voice, the singing. But, you know, it's like that with so many. Mary J. Blige singing one with you two made that song amazing. You know, when I hear Empire State of Mind, I love Jay on it, of course. But Alicia, you know, when she goes into that chorus, it just, as a New Yorker, it makes me cry. I mean, so to me, as a woman, I've always been interested in women's voices. So I always championed women's voices and women. And unfortunately, I didn't write this book sooner because I only wrote about 40 women in this book and I've interviewed hundreds. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I'm sorry I didn't write this book later because Cardi and Lizzo and Megan and, you know, the book was already finished before I could talk to them. Part two, part two, Lisa. Maybe, we'll see. <laughs> and it's you know, a struggle. There's also that cliche that you actually address in this book. And I wanna know if you think this is still relevant today about, for a woman artist, right? Women have to want to be you and men have to want to fuck you. And you bring that up. And do you think that still holds true? I absolutely think that if I was a fly on the wall in the rooms where those men are discussing who they're going to sign, they absolutely talk differently than when a woman is in the room. We know this. Women talk differently among themselves when a man is not in the room. And I think that those men who make those deals still say things like, well, I'd fuck her, or, oh, she has a great body, or something like that. Um, women want to identify with other women because that's why so many women have so many female fans, you know? So I think the combination of both, I know it's a cliche, but I think it works. I mean, I think it's true. I think that the men, mostly men and hopefully that will be changing but and it is changing to some degree i mean julie greenwald has the ability to sign cardi b you know um but there aren't enough of those women uh but those women will sign somebody that they feel women will also love and think are fabulous and um i don't know what what woman would not have wanted to look like or sound like or be like Rihanna. I mean, she's fantastic, you know? And then there are those men who think she's sexy. And that's the other reason that they wanted to sign her. Although Jay told me that when she auditioned for him, she had fire in her eyes. And when I told her he said that, she said, I didn't know I had fire in my eyes. But, you know, I think that cliche is a cliche for a reason. Yeah, they do. I mean, they do. I agree with you, but they do that with guys too. Like they'll tell guys that you know, they, if, if a guy's in a relationship or he's married, they'll tell guys not to let people know that they're in a relationship or they're married because girls gotta have the illusion that they can get with you. Well, that's an age-old thing. That's absolutely true. I mean, even John Lennon did not publicize that he was married in the early days of the Beatles because they were too afraid that the fan club would be turned off. And I guess. I mean, I guess that's still true. Um, I'm trying to think of some examples, you know. Um, well, it's changed. I, think, who? Because, I mean, it's changed now just because guys are open about being married, you know? And yeah, I mean, I think it was great. When Jay married Beyonce, I think that really set an example. You know, I think when people are famous and they talk about their families or they talk about their children, I mean, that's just normal, that's life. And to hide that stuff is kind of old fashioned, I guess. It's ridiculous. Um, I'm trying to think of any current male stars who still try to pretend that they're single. I don't know, I don't think, I mean, do they? Justin Bieber we know is married, Jay's married, you know. Um, we know who the weekend goes out with. We know a lot about a lot of people. I feel like I mean, it's, harder to, it's harder to hide things now too. I'm sorry? Harder to, well, that's what I was just gonna say. You know, I came up at a time when there was no social media, there was no Instagram, there was no 
cell phones. There were no, everybody had a camera. You know, people had much more privacy. You know, I mean, I was just talking about this with even Cheryl Crow last week. And she said she had to leave Hollywood because she had been diagnosed with breast cancer. Her engagement to Lance Armstrong had been broken and she could not leave her house without the paparazzi outside. Cher told me the same thing though, when she was going out with Rob Camaletti, who the paparazzi, the, the tabloid press called the bagel boy because he worked in a bakery she said there were people in the bushes of her houses trying to take pictures of her, you know? So there always was the paparazzi situation, but not like now. Now you cannot go out of your house without everybody having a camera and yeah, taking it's pictures. Not even, it's not even paparazzi, it's the regular person. I know. Table next to you. I know, I know. I mean, I literally, it's just like, when I interviewed Rihanna in a private room of a restaurant, there were thousands of paparazzis outside screaming and yelling her name. And I said to her, how do you deal with this? And she said, forget them. She said, I can't even go shopping because there's somebody in a store who will take my picture, you know, and I don't want to have to always put on makeup and, you know, get dressed up to go shopping in the supermarket. And I wish I could go shopping. And actually I have a whole part in yeah. the book about this, about how all these women told me, that they wished they could go shopping for their groceries. And I said, really? It's a luxury. I mean, to me, it's a chore. You know, I would much rather have someone go shopping for my groceries. And Rihanna said, no, it's just something normal. I want to do something normal. And Adele told me she would put on a hat and sunglasses and go shopping at Bristol Farms. And Lady Gaga told me she would go to the supermarket and buy a melon. But, you know, I've walked down the street with a lot of these people and a lot of famous people. And I remember David Bowie telling me there was a way you could walk down the street where you get recognized and a way you walk down the street where you don't get recognized. And I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I walked down the street with Lady Gaga on the Lower East Side where she used to live. And she got stopped every two seconds. But she was delightful and charming and signed every autograph and you know there are just some people that are really Tina Turner was like that wonderful just amazing you know Alicia Keys is like that she's very very gracious um Patti LaBelle I can't say enough about <laughs> Patti LaBelle who I, I know well you know my husband worked at a record company with the Osley Brothers and Curtis Mayfield and the Impressions at the very end of the 60s. And he knew when they were Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells and they did, I sold my heart to the junk band. And I got friendly with Nona Hendrix and Patti and, you know, Vicki Wickham, who was their manager at the time. And that is, that Patti is a woman who, I mean, I just, you're just filled with love when you're around her. She's so special. She's just lovely. And so that just, when there are women like that, like Dolly Parton, like Patti LaBelle, like Bette Midler, like Tina Turner, like Anita Baker, like just, I don't know. When you see women like that and you talk to women like that and you know women like that, who are even of a certain age, who have been through the mill, who struggled, who just went through every possible thing that women could go through and they still, are lovely and gracious and warm and friendly. And then you see some of these brats. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. To me, I'm very inspired still by a lot of these women. You know, Lisa, I got two more questions for you. Um, Cause you talked about Lord earlier and how Lord loved to shoot down the ideas from, from old men. Do you, do you think the challenges of age override gender in the entertainment industry? Man, that's a tough one because I am a woman and I'm of a certain age and I still have a career, but that is by the nature of my forceful personality and my drive and my work ethic. Um, I do think that when women get to be a certain age, they get written off. There's no question. But then 
you get back to the thing of, well, maybe we're in the era of the age of the old woman. You know, Joni Mitchell at one point before she had a stroke um, was the face of Yves Saint Laurent. You know, Patti LaBelle was on the cover of the New York Times Magazine section a few weeks ago when they had divas and they had Barbara Streisand and they had Dolly Parton and they had Patty. And I was so happy to see Patty there. Um, I think that there are many of us who appreciate the history and the legacy of older women. And I think that a lot of older women just get put out to pasture. And I think it's partly female and it's partly um, age. I mean, Mick Jagger is 77. And once the virus is over, if they're all alive, the Rolling Stones are planning to go on tour. And he dances around the stage and prances around and he works out five hours a day. And, you know, I don't see a woman that age doing that. So I just think that, as I said, that agent said to me, no woman that age could do that. So I think it's a combination of both, Charlemagne, I do. I think it's female, I think it's gender. I also think we have to really address race in this because I think there's no question that black women have a much, much harder time. Um, I know from my own work, and especially my first 10 years at Vanity Fair, that it was much harder for me to get black women in the magazine. It's like what Bevy Smith said about Rolling Stone. You know, I grew up hearing blues in my household. I grew up listening to Ma Rainey and Lead Belly and Big Mama Thornton. I mean, it was a very unusual upbringing. I snuck out of my house at the age of 12 to go see Thelonious Monk or Miles Davis or to listen to jazz musicians and singers like Sarah Vaughan or Larez Alexandria or Dakota Staten. You're all gonna have to Google these because these women have been maybe long forgotten, unfortunately, because the music is wonderful. And when my husband played Tina Turner and Vanetta Fields, another name you should look up, or P.P. Arnold, who was a black English singer who did Cat Stevens' first cut is the deepest. When he played that on Freeform Radio in 1969, he got fired for playing unfamiliar music. Then they hired him again. And I mean, he was a white hippie guy with long hair, but he loved that music. He had a crush on Tina Turner. He was jealous when I interviewed Tina Turner. And, you know, um, he played Jimi Hendrix's Star Spangled Banner got fired because it was unpatriotic. So I write a lot about this in the book, but I think that all of these things, just like real life, come into play. I think gender, I think ageism, and I think race has a lot to do with it. And people don't talk about it enough and white people don't talk about it enough. And that's kind of like part of my whole agenda. You know, just having interviewed thousands, I mean, I have 5,000 hours of digitized interviews. The original ones are behind me. The digitized ones are on computer and on external hard drives. And boy, I don't know. There's just so much there. And I've seen so much and talked to so many people that I know I'm going way off the topic, but you asked if it was gender or age, and I think it's probably both for women. But I also think that for a lot of men, you know, they have problems too. I mean, I'm not just saying this is like a man's world, even though in many ways it is, but it's not fair. It's still not equal. And it's not equal. I mean, Charlamagne, ask your wife how she is treated in a store when you're with her or when she's alone. I mean, I am telling you, my husband did not believe the deference that was paid to me when he was standing next to me, as opposed to if I walked in somewhere alone. I'm not saying I was disrespected, but it's just not the same. You are considered 
more when you have a husband. You are considered more legitimate if you got a man. You know, people still say things like, oh, she can't get a man. I mean, it's unbelievable to me. Yeah. You know, uh, it still goes on. Just even- like all the rest of the problems we see in this country, all the social injustice, all the horrible things that we, I mean, not just that we saw this summer, we've been seeing for years. It's just like, I don't know, this country's got a lot of problems. Let's put it that way. A lot of work. No, my, not a work to be done. My last question for you, Lisa, because you are a journalist. Yeah, you're, 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 you're a journalist in, in the real sense of journalism, OG, old school journalism. Do you think social media has watered down the craft of real journalism? Yeah, I kind of do in a way. I mean, I'm not on social media. Yes, you are. Uh, you have an Instagram page. Well, you created it, but I don't even know how to go on it. And the thing is, I find the internet, you know, that that documentary social dilemma is really pretty intense. Um, I think the internet can be a cesspool. I think it can be toxic. I think it's tragic in a lot of ways for kids now, you know, especially during this pandemic, there was a story in the Times about how the screen time and Xbox and all of that stuff has increased with alarming um, uh, extreme because these kids don't know what else to do and they're stuck in their house. And I think that that's gonna change social interaction possibly in general, or maybe people will just be so thrilled to get outside and see their friends again. I don't know. I mean, I know personally that a lot of musicians want to control their own narrative. Mm -hmm. They do it on their own social media. And so they don't feel they need us anymore. That's absolutely true. On the other, I mean, magazines certainly, I don't know, do they matter? I mean, I'm at Vanity Fair. People still want to talk to me. I did a very lengthy interview with Alicia Keys recently. I did one with Damian Lillard, you know, Dame Dalla, because I'm a huge (laughs) basketball fan. And I think he actually can rap, considering most basketball players think they can and they can't. But they want to do it on the web because more people read it online. But I do think social media has curtailed a lot of access that we have as journalists to people. Um, But I don't know, you know, I go and I sit in Rock Nation and I sit with Juan Odez and they're always saying, oh, like, she's this journalist. She traveled with the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin and, you know, Jay trusts her and this and that. And so I think to some people, it's still important. I don't know about kids on TikTok or people with Instagram accounts or 12, if those musicians are going to want to grow up and ever talk to a real journalist or an OG. Thank you. I love that. Um, it definitely has changed it. Don't you find that? Absolutely. Although, I don't know, people still want to talk to you. People still want to come on this show. Yeah, but you I don't know. think, I, don't, I, I think my, my biggest issue with it is back in the day, or even now when you do interviews, Lisa, you had to make sure you were reporting facts. You couldn't report yeah. what you felt about a person. You couldn't report some BS rumor that doesn't have right. accurate sources to it. Like you couldn't do that. Are you, that, that magazine and you would face consequences and repercussions. Nowadays, people just say anything. And it'd be I know. Crazy. Yeah, no, you're completely correct. And that is really true. And not only did I have to say the truth, I always quoted people accurately. That was something incredibly important to me. I would have three and a half hour interviews, say with Rihanna, and I would transcribe it myself and I would make sure I got every word right. And I still, actually, I did all my interviews and this, which I did Michael Jackson with. And funnily enough, when I first interviewed Beyonce, she said, and I write about this in the book, she said, did you ever think of moving up to digital? And I had three analog tape recorders My husband set up a digital tape recorder for me. He drew a diagram of how to work it, like (laughs) I were five years old or something. And guess which one didn't work, the digital. And I still use this thing, 
Miss Blackberry to yes, text you do. people. And I'm kind of a tech moron, but I did research every interview I ever did. I listened to every music that anybody, every record anybody ever made. So I was prepared. And then I threw away all the questions and just went in and talked to them. But when I reported it, I was very in-depth and very accurate. And I worked for places, except the New York Post for a long time, where they had fact checkers. And a lot of people don't have fact checkers anymore or copy editors. And yeah, people make up stuff and they just put shit online and on Instagram and whatever they feel like. And of course, I would never, ever do that. I mean, I, I find that shocking. And Lisa, what a different yes. feeling it what a different feeling it is to do those interviews that you did in person, traveling with people, really getting to know them, as opposed to us being on Zoom right now. Well, I would so much rather be in the studio with you guys. And maybe one day I will be able to come back and talk to you in person so. because I don't love Zoom. I really don't like I it. it. I mean, I just think it's kind of, it's better than not being able to do it. Let's put it that way. But, you know, this, this virus has really just screwed up everybody's lives. And it did not have to. If we had had an administration who had known about this or listened to Obama's you know, warnings or whatever they had left for them. If this criminal in chief had ever read a briefing or read anything for that matter, fortunately, I don't know when this is gonna air, but hopefully he'll be gone by then. I mean, he's gone already as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, I think that Zoom, phone interviews. It's not the same as sitting down with somebody. Of course not. It's the same as if you had to have Zoom cocktails with your friends, as opposed to sitting in a restaurant and, you know, having a glass of wine or going out to dinner or any of the stuff. And I, I don't know who it's worse for. I don't know if it's worse for someone such as myself who doesn't, I don't know how many years I have left and they took one away from me or for kids who don't have a social life now. You know, I speak to a lot of women in their 20s who are trying to meet guys online, dating, and I just, I feel bad for them because they don't have the chance to go to clubs and meet people and hook up and have fun or have sex or whatever. You know, we at least had our youth and our life. I right. mean, right now, this Zoom stuff, it's weird. I agree. Well, nobody no. ever asked me about the girls, women, music, and fame is out right now by the great Lisa Robinson. I, I, you're one of my favorite people to have conversations with, Lisa. Thank you. You guys are my favorite, favorite show. I have to tell you, I don't wake up at nine in the morning or 10 in the morning, but I DVR it every day and I watch it. And I've learned a lot from watching your show, especially when the videos are on, because that's how I see a lot of new music. So thank you too. And Lisa's, but, not, Lisa's not bullshitting us either because Lisa texts me every day about something that was said on The Breakfast Club. Well, Angie knows I text her too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Lisa, I appreciate you so much. And for everything that you've done, I encourage everybody to go out and get this. It is really great information to have to see all the Sade is in the book. I oh mean, yeah, Sade, right. That was a rare interview. Very. She didn't do too many, yeah. We had a great interview. There's a hideous picture of me in there with her though. She's beautiful. I was going through a particularly hideous time with way too much makeup and bad hair. I look like a drag queen, but we won't go into that. <laughs> Amazing, amazing to get all of these exclusive firsthand interviews that you have. So thank you so much, Lisa. And I know we'll see you in person soon. Thank you, Lisa. I hope so. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate you. Thank you.